After 10 years of experiments, the public at last gets a preview of television. With the inauguration of two weekly broadcasts, set owners in metropolitan New York and visitors to the World's Fair see a suggestion of what may be expected of this new medium. Sets are offered for sale at prices ranging from about $200 to $600. And proud set owners explain television to admiring friends. There will probably be as many of these amateur explanations as there are set owners. And an examination of the set contributes little to an understanding of the subject. Except for the screen and slanted mirror that reflects the image to the audience, it is much like a radio in appearance. But in the laboratories where modern television equipment has been developed, we get a better view of the tubes that have added two new words to our vocabularies. The iconoscope for the camera and the kinescope for the receiver. The iconoscope is mounted behind the lens in this crude laboratory camera. The lens focuses the image of the experimental chart upon a metal plate in the tube, and the iconoscope turns the image into electricity. In a nearby laboratory receiver, the kinescope tube is inserted. This tube receives the electrical impulses created in the iconoscope tube and recreates the image. As the tube is turned on, we see the pattern of the scanning beam of electrons that moves back and forth across its face over 13,000 times a second and carries the electrical impulses that create the picture. In the laboratory, the iconoscope and kinescope are connected by wire. An actual broadcast, the television transmitter atop the Empire State Building sends the program out from this antenna by imposing it on a very short radio wave which acts as a carrier for both the picture and sound. These short radio waves travel only in a straight line and cannot follow the curve of the Earth's surface. Therefore, the limit of television is the distance from the antenna to the horizon. From the Empire State Building, a program can be sent only as far as the eye can see on a perfectly clear day. Television receivers outside of the New York metropolitan area and other areas where transmitters are in operation will be useless until transmitters are erected within their range. In New York, Programs are sent to the transmitter over a special cable from the television studios in Radio City, three quarters of a mile away, or are sent by radio to the transmitter by the mobile units, which cover sporting events, outdoor celebrations, and spot news of all kinds. A mobile television unit consists of two large trucks. One of these is a rolling control room and amplifier, and the other is a small radio transmitter which sends the program over the air to the main transmitter in the Empire State Building. Typical of programs covered by the mobile television units is a horse race, and this unit pulls into the racetrack early in the morning to start the elaborate preparations of setting up to cover the race. one truck are reels of the special coaxial cable that carries the picture from the camera to the trucks. While this is dragged out, engineers raise the antenna on top of the truck from which the program will be broadcast, and the cameramen set up the portable iconoscope camera atop the grandstand. Inside the truck, equipment is tested, and the coaxial cable is raised to the roof of the stand to connect camera and trucks. With a connection made, the camera is turned on for a test, and engineers stand by as race time approaches. Then on top of the stand, announcer Clem McCarthy takes his place beside the television camera, and the program goes on the air. Judge Hasten on the extreme outside, keeps stepping out of his stall, delaying the start as the 12 thoroughbreds line up at the gate. Now they're all in there and behaving nicely. Look out, they're off. Interpreter number two breaks in front. And as the field races past the stands, it's interpreter on top with Sunfax in second place. The field is closely bunched as they rush to the first turn, but they've a long way to go. It's still anybody's race. Down the back stretch, Sunfax is dropping back. And as they turn into the home stretch, Albert D leads by two lengths with Mundu at second ahead of a closely bunched field. Down the stretch, Albert D turns on more speed, he increases his lead, he's too fast for Mondo it, and Albert D by four lengths is the winner. As in radio, most television programs will come from the specially equipped studios, such as this one in Radio City. Here under the hot bright lights required for indoor broadcasts, preparations are underway to televise an orchestral program. Cameramen make last minute adjustments on the iconoscope camera which is similar to the crude laboratory model, except that it has two lenses. The lower lens projects the image on the iconoscope tube, while the cameraman watches the action on the ground glass behind the upper lens, 
changing focus by twisting the handles of the camera. The special lights of the television studios are placed under the direction of the cameraman. Most of these lights are suspended from the ceiling and controlled by cords, by means of which they can be raised, lowered, or turned by a technician on the floor below. As broadcast time approaches, members of the orchestra file into the studio and take their places, proud to be among the first artists whose pictures are carried through the air. In the control booth above the studio, the program director and engineers prepare for their part in the broadcast. Here the picture and sound are amplified for their trip to the transmitter, and the quality is checked on a viewing screen. Cameramen and engineers wear earphones through which they receive instructions throughout the broadcast from the director. As the first step in the program, the title camera is trained on the printed titles, and these are sent out over the air. Then at a signal from the director, the television broadcast gets underway. Each of the cameras used in this broadcast is making a different angle of the same scene. This long shot camera is permanently placed to get a view of the entire orchestra. A second camera on a wheel truck is used to make close-ups of the orchestra and its individual members. And this is rolled around the studio during the broadcast. On the screen in the control room, we see a scene made by the close-up camera. After this has run for a few seconds, the control engineer switches over to the other camera and the scene changes to a long shot of the entire orchestra. The director manipulates the cameras to keep the scene changing and to avoid monotony, instructing the cameramen and engineers by telephone as the program progresses. All right, switch to one. Now roll into a close-up of the string section. across the orchestra from the brass to the strings. Now back to your original position and pan over to include the conductor. And so a new industry steps out of the laboratory into the limelight as television makes its bow to the American public. Where it will go from here is any man's guess. For while it fills a long felt need for visual entertainment and instruction in the home, its scope and audience will be limited for some time to come. But no matter what its future may be, it brings to us today the realization that a milestone of progress has been passed and science has made a reality of pictures from the sky.